Good evening, everyone, and welcome along to the Rangers Rabble Friday Night Podcast. I'm Wolf, standing in at the last minute for Martin, who's been called away in family business. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Scott, Richie, and Davy Scott Kerr. How are you, sir? I'm all right, Wolf. Well, I'm off the day, but I'm back in the morning. I've got more work to win, so I'll be getting straight to Ibox after that. But fine, so after the morning, I'm off for a week, so looking forward to that. I'm going off for ages, so I'm looking forward to just a wee break. Good stuff. Richie, how's things down Merseyside, apart from uh, my fellow St. Herman's fans celebrating a good win over the Pies this afternoon? <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, that's the talk of the day with the, the Easter Rugby League schedule. But no, I'm I'm all good. Thanks, Wolf. Good to see you and I'm glad to be on. It's it's felt with what with the Dundee game and all of that debacle, it's it's felt like some time since that Benfica game. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, like, like a child on um, Christmas Eve, ready to get going into the final section of this title challenge. Great stuff. And Davey, how's things with you, Puff? i just so glad that that international break's over. Well, I don't care too much for international football on the whole, uh, especially no during uh, mid-season. So just can't kind of wait to get tomorrow uh, underway. Yeah, I'm exactly, I'm exactly the same. I'm really, really looking forward to it. I could see international football far enough. But anyway, we can uh, we can maybe touch on that later. So, so Scott, I don't know if you've if you've seen the map while well, you've been off today, so you've got no excuse not for seeing it at the manager's press conference earlier on. I've seen um, something Good. He gave us a, an injury update, and we've got um, Dijon Sterling, Kieran Dowell, Abdullah Sima, and Ross McCausland all, all back on the training pitch, all available for tomorrow, but none of them ready to do 90 minutes. No, but you can see that obviously Dow's been out for a while and so is Seema. Ross has been maybe playing through the pain barrier at times and Sterling maybe as well. So that's him we've got he'll put up a team strong enough to get the three points, hopefully, but you don't want to rush them back, and make things worse, especially with Seema who's been out for a quite a while. So as long as they can put in some minutes between now and the end of the season, I'll be happy with that because we know they can when they do play they can offer us something. Yeah, and uh, and Richie, uh, the other the other side of that is that Red Van's still out. Uh, Ryan Jack's injured again. Don't know what that is. Whether that's the one he had before or if he's got another one. Obviously, Oscar Cortez is still still out with whatever he had, and Danilo's not available yet. Yeah, we've obviously still got um, a few of the long term injuries that are you know likely to to rumble on. Um, it. It's disappointing with Ryan Jack, but it's it's not surprising at all. And you know, I think that that's just going to play out for the remainder of the season. Th- thankfully, even with some of the difficulties that we've had, we've yeah you know, we've had very um, capable um, th- th- those two sort of um, deeper line midfielder roles. Of you know, we've 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 been able to fill them with some really good additions. So hopefully, we won't feel that too much. Even though, of course, you you want to have the ability to change things up at, at this stage of the season with Ridvan I, I was just relieved to initially hear that you know it was maybe seven to ten days after fearing the worst when he came off in the first half of that turkey game um and we'll see how close he is to to get him back for the old firm just hopefully he can you know take his time over the weekend and then um we, we really desperately need him back for, for next Sunday, I would say. So, yeah, all eyes on that. But the, the, not too surprising. And, and some positive news in there with, um, well, yeah, with returns for um, for several people that have been out for a while. So hopefully Seema can um, can start stepping up some minutes and, and get back on that left-hand side because I think that's really crucial for us as well. Yeah, Davey, the manager saying that none of the four that are that were injured and that are returning um, are available for 90 minutes to eat. Do you, do you think that that means none of them will start, or do you think he might start like Sterling at left back rather than throwing Barisic in, or is it just a case of he's going to have maybe a couple of them on the bench and try and give them twenty minutes towards the end of the match? I take one of your points there first, Wolf, when it comes to Borna Barisic. Now, for me, if we take Borna Barisic in isolation, his Rangers career as a whole, he probably gets pass marks. However. In big games, in games when it matters, Borna Barisic will always be the first person to let you down. And his performance at Rugby Park, for me, you know, he just looks spooked. Danny Armstrong was in his head the whole sort of first half. 
you know, mouthing away at them and he just got totally spooked by the occasion. And I don't think it's a game where we can risk Borna. He signed his pre-contract with Trabs on Sport during the week. And for me, he, you know, is on very thin ice and I would use him sparingly if at all. Uh, so if Sterling's available to play at left back, I know we've got injuries in other positions and he might be needed on the right hand side and he did do a good job against the Hibs left back and, and, and maybe that'll be in Clement's sort of thoughts coming into it but for me absolutely no way would Borna Barisic be in my thoughts for the start of living tomorrow and you know it's such a, a, a sad end to you know a sort of up and down career but there's too many important games between now and the end of the season, if you're going to go to war and you're going to go to battle, you need people that can dig you out in the trenches, and Borna Barisic is not one of them. All right, Scott, picking up what Davy says here, Paul makes a makes a, a thing I never really thought of. You could you could potentially play Balogun at left back tomorrow. I mean, I personally don't think Sterling will start, so putting Sterling in the right wing, I don't think it's an option to start the game. Because going by what the manager says, he's going to have to decide which of the returning players will be on the bench because you can't have four players on the bench that can only do a limited period of time just in case. But, I mean, to pick up Paul's point, Balogun for left-back, potentially? You could, you could also play Ben Davis. I know Ben's not seen a lot of minutes and probably leaving in the summer as well, but he has a left-sided defender, so he could probably put in there and do well for 90 minutes. I know he's played in Europe on the left side at times in an emergency, so we, you need to put some in there. I, I agree with David when he goes with Borna. I think Borna's time's over, I think. He knows that himself. That's why he's leaving, and I think. It's very hard to put him in to get a lot out of him because I think he's mentally tuned away for the club. I think he just would like to maybe start afresh somewhere. And he has been a good servant, to be honest with you. He only cost us just, just over a million pounds. So he's done reasonably well. But I think we have to look forward. And Bally can go fit in there. Let's say Ben Davis. Out in the right, I was even thinking about Stellan. I was thinking maybe giving Cole McKinnon minutes if uh, Lawrence and uh, Campbell maybe play one of them out in the left or the right as well. It'll be difficult for manager because they have been putting a lot of players out of position and you're getting a tune out of them. To be honest with you, when you put out positions and Sterling's probably found new positions out of this because when he came to the club, he was penciled in as a, a, a player that can play defensively, right or left, centre, back or full back as well. But now he can play defensive mid, he can play right side in the field. He's mainly a utility player for the captain, but... It's up to Maj, he's going to pick his best level to start the game with defence can win. It'll be a tough game and we have to perform better than we did in the last home game, which was against one of them. Yep, and I just before we carry on, I'd just like to answer Smoke my draw. Yes, Smoke, I was actually supposed to be off tonight, but Martin's had to go away on family business and so got called in off the bench at the last minute. So anybody that saw my, my little thing on the uh old thumb allocation, which we'll get on to. That I did for the Twitter earlier on. Uh, I did say I wasn't on tonight, so I gave my opinion on it there. But I, as you can see, I'm on tonight. So yeah, it's it's one of them. Something you just got to step up at the last minute. So a good day, a good day watching the rugby league. So I'm quite happy to be here. Thank you very much indeed. So um, yeah, yeah, Richie, going back to the you know the, the manager, the manager's press conference. He was asked a question about the, um, the the international break and was it good to have the players all together and. His, his, his response was, well, they haven't together. They were all over the place. We've only had them back for today. It was the only day they've all been back because we had a couple of players away. Um, Cortez, eh, Cor Cortez. Silva played on um, Tuesday night. And so did somebody else played on Tuesday night. Who else played on Tuesday night? Somebody else played Dessers, was well. it? Dessers played on Tuesday night as well. Mm -hmm. So they only, they only came back into, into the building. Uh, this morning. So do you think that's going to have an effect on the team that you picked tomorrow, or do you think they're both almost destined to start? Um, well, yeah, I think Dessas will play some part tomorrow. Um, as for whether he starts or not, I'm not too sure. I think, I think that might well be Silva, but I, I don't um, I, I do take his point on that the, the international break for us was all about limiting um, potential injuries, which we didn't quite manage to do. Um, and getting players that weren't quite at it, who aren't involved on the international scene, back up to speed, and resting players that looked like painfully tired towards the back end. There, I'm so pleased for um, Lonnie to have a fortnight to, you know, to do whatever R and Rs required because yeah, the, there were some real tired 
bodies and that Benfica performance and some of the preceding ones. So I think they were the, the main things, but I think it's fair what what he's saying. And I think that the guys that have been um, away on international duty, that there's not been the same kind of travelling schedule for, for some of the players that are particularly far afield as there might have been. Um, so I don't think there's any issue with them starting. And as you touched upon earlier, you know, the, the players that are now sort of back in training aren't going to get 90 minutes. He's he said that we, we wouldn't expect that anyway. So um, I think it's going to come a point where, yeah, these players that have featured on international duty are, are going to have to to play their part because they're, they're, they're fit and, and ready to go. It, it's no different in some respects to, to having a, um, a league game in terms of their sort of physical recovery. So yeah, I expect them to, to play their part and then they'll absolutely need to given our, our current situation. Yeah, Dave, you see GM says here who, who was actually away. Suter's Suter Ness as Matondo didn't play. Suter played what 20 minutes for Scotland, I think, in the first game on Friday night. Uh, Dessers did play, he played twice for Nigeria, scored in the first one, was an absolute sitter on Tuesday, which I'm sure everybody's seen. I mean, I think the ball's the ball's still halfway to the space station, I think. Uh, Matondo obviously sat on the bench in Wales, he hasn't really travelled very far. Silva played two under 23 games, which even if it is well below his level, still a lot of football to play in a short space of time. But as as uh, CGM rightly says, players like Goldson and Lundstrom, who looked absolutely shattered, got a good rest over the, the two-week break. So from that point of view, it probably has done some of the players an awful lot of good. Yep, yeah, and if you listen to Philip Clement's press conference today, I thought there was a very interesting question that was raised by... Adam Thornton, a hand, heart and hand, where he asked in regards to set pieces, which seems to have been our Achilles heel, you know, maybe over the last six, seven weeks. And I thought he made a, a really good point, Clement, in sort of enforcing the fact that it is something that they've been working on, uh, you know, with the guys that have been there. So I'm expecting variation in our play tomorrow. I think that the break would have done the world of good to players like Tav, Goldson, Lundstrom, Tom Lawrence, because he was kind of forced into playing the games to, towards the end there. Even Diamande as well. He had just played maybe too many minutes and I think it'll all give them a chance to, to regroup. I'm expecting Tom Lawrence to make a big impact between now and the end of the season because he's the one type of midfielder that's different to any other. He's a bit more direct. He'll take shots from all over. It won't always come off, but he puts himself there. He makes great late runs into the box when the ball goes out wide. So he's probably got the most variation in his play, all the midfielders that we have. And I think he'll be a great option going forward. I hope that we don't stick to full backs taking corners because the opposition are going to expect that. So just adding a wee bit of variation into the play, changing the set piece taker, you know, might throw the opposition. Uh, I can't see him making any changes in terms of his back to I know Balogun, for example, you know, hasn't really played since the mask uh, came on. He's probably lost that now. But if it's working between Goldson and Suter, the vast majority of times, I see no reason for him to change that. So I think he'll stick with those two. Yeah, I think so as well. And Scott, talking about, about the press conference, um, it was the the player that the player that they put up today was Todd Cantwell, and Todd Todd was asked a quite a cheeky question again towards the end of the press conference about the fact he's been playing in a number ten. Did he knock on the manager's door? Or did the manager just say, that's where I'm playing you? And he, I thought he batted it away quite well and went, I'm not going to tell you my private conversations with the manager. But do you think that is that is his best position and do you think that's where we should be playing him? Yeah, that's not, I think that's his best position. But every football player's got, got a position they like the best. and I think they get the best out. I can't milk, can't milk in there. I think before they get injured, he was on a decent run. He was starting to play at a better level. He was getting involved, creating goals. He was also scoring goals. And they get injured again, but I think that's where we see the best of But I know he can play out wide, but I know at the time he does does not crack his runner and stuff like that. But he, t- he did mention it himself, didn't he? He says he'll play wherever he's told, but he does say he favours the number 10 role because that's where he feels he does his best work. But listen, that question he was asked, he did say it to the guy right enough, good try, but he, he just wasn't going to answer it. It's one of the things that's been him and the manager, and it doesn't mean it's a bad question to ask. We all ask our bosses questions that. Make no one to answer, but you have to ask him anyway. And footballers are the same. Maybe, maybe you're just asking 
am I going to get back into play there because I can give you more there? That's probably all I asked. And Clement's probably, come on, I, come on, did come out and say at the time he was probably, a, he probably at his best position, but he just had to play him out right because we were short of numbers at that time. I, I might be wrong, but I'm sure he said something along the lines. So, listen, I think Campbell comes back in tomorrow. I think he has to. I think he miss him. I do agree with David, whereas Lawrence is slightly different. But I think Todd offers more in a different way for Tom Lawrence sitting there. I think I think Lawrence is a different type of footballer, but I think Campbell's more mobile. I think he gets about the pitch better. But I do think they both them complement each other. I think we get a good understanding, both of us. Yeah, well, before we carry on, Charles has given us a, a super chat. Thanks very much for that, Charles. Absolutely fantastic support of the pod. Uh, she still won't play left back tomorrow. As, as I said earlier, I don't think I don't think Sterling will start. The way the manager speaking, none of the four injured players will start. I just thought I would throw that out there. Um, but he hopes it's not born, especially next week. Hopefully, Red Van's back for next week. The manager was a bit coy about whether he'd be back or not, but hopefully, um, Red Van is back for next week. But again, Charles, thanks for that. Absolutely uh, tremendous. Uh, there was another comment I saw here that's coming your way, Richie, if I can find it, um, about how we fit... Who we fit all the midfield players into the team? Uh, where's it going? I meant to start it and I forgot. Uh, it was basically how do, how do we fit Cantwell, Lawrence? I think Cantwell Lawrence was at Matondo and Court. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we on? Yeah, I, I've got it. I think um, I think it was CGM. Um, was, how do we fit Campbell Lawrence and over in Diamande? That's the fella. There you go. Just at that, yeah. there we go. Sorry, that's really, that's really bad podcast. Really bad person. Yeah, how do we fit <laughs> Campbell Lawrence Silva and Diamande into our team? Or do we? Well, yeah. I mean, firstly, it's a good problem to have, isn't it? Given some of the, the issues that we've been experiencing this season. I mean, for me, uh, Kerr's touched upon it. Campbell's a number 10. He's, he said himself, I've, I've always thought that he was better in, in that role. Like we've, we've seen him in a slightly different um, formation, playing slightly deeper under uh, he who shall not be named, um, or else I think oh. Davey will burst into flames he, if I start talking about it. He, he, <laughs> so, yeah, he so shall he, be named very shortly. He shall be named very okay, shortly. Okay, all right, Quite good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I much prefer him in the 10. Lawrence, Lawrence is good in the sense that he can play in that deeper role um, alongside Lundstrom or Diamande. He can also play on the left-hand side. And we might need that tomorrow if we're going to play Matondo on the right, depending on where we're at with Sterling and McCausland, who we know aren't going to play 90 minutes. Silva, we've seen more recently on the left, but he'd been played through the centre for the majority of the time. So uh, I think the answer is that we'll see we'll see them appearing in, in slightly different variations uh, and we'll see their minutes managed, and and that's the way it's going to have to be for the remainder of the season. Um, I do think that Clement prefers Silver through the middle, um, and I know that some people much prefer him on the left. I, I had thought when he first came in that I'd wanted to see him on the left, but I'm I've, I'm probably happier seeing him through the middle now that I've seen him in the left hand side. I, I think he can the the way he tra tracks back picks up the ball, reads the play, invites others, it invites those three behind him in. I, I like to see that. So I think he'll continue to share minutes with Dessas. Diamande and Lawrence are quite near to a lock for me in, in those deeper line midfield positions. Um, so, so that's how we fit him in. Um, yeah, and I think as long as Cantwell's fit, I think he should be our, our first choice number 10. But but, but of course, um, as we get more players back, we'll, we will see those minutes managed. And, and I'm quite happy with that. I, I don't think we necessarily need to have this idea of a first choice 11. Um, I don't think that's you know how, how you win trebles, really. So, yeah, that's I don't know if that's answered the question, but that's my take on it anyway. Well, so, Davey, where does that leave John Lindstrom or is she just going to go to Turkey, as has been rumoured? Well... The only thing on that, well, is John Lundstrom's entitled to do whatever's best for John Lundstrom and John Lundstrom's family. So if it's top dollar in Turkey and he opts to take it, then then good luck to him. What I would say on John Lundstrom's Rangers career, and I think this is me playing devil's advocate and being totally objective, is we haven't won a league title as yet since he's been here. So that's the first sort of 
thing that I would say in regards to it as well. And he had a good sort of two to three months the season that we got to the Europa League final. He's had a tremendous season this season in terms of consistency, and it's been his best. But that's only since Philippe Clement has come in the door. He wasn't kicking a barn door before the manager, you know, got into. And don't get me wrong, a lot of players weren't. So on John Lundstrom's sort of whole career, we got him for nothing. If he goes for nothing, for me, if if he stays, he's only going to be a mainstay because of his age for possibly another season. I think Clement, in terms of the way he wants to play football, will look to get a more athletic type in his role, a big, powerful player, um, an athlete type to replace him, a younger model, because that's the way that he wants to play football. So I wouldn't be, you know, totally disappointed, you know, if he decides to make that move for himself and his family. In terms of how he's played this season, it will be a massive loss. Um, because I don't think that Raskan has um, done anything for us in terms of since he's come back for his injury, other than his sort of six months under Michael Beale at the start. And re- he's really had a couple of chances in, in recent weeks. And, and you've got to grab the jersey when you get the opportunity to do so. And I've been really disappointed with Raskin. So I think Clement's looking ahead. Um, but... For me, John Lundstrom's Rangers career, you're sort of 50-50. You know, that's where it is. He's had some good games. He's so, he's had some bad games. But until he sort of changes that, you know, winning a league title since he's been here, then for me, it's, you know, it, it could do better. Yeah, I mean, it sounded like what the manager said um, in today's press conference, Scott, that he says there's no there's no deal done if there was would know about it, but he's very very confident that um, that Looney's that Looney's going to stay. So as Davy says, he's, he's entitled to go where he wants. But I mean, I I personally think he probably will stay. And there's a sort of mixed opinion in the comments of how long how long a deal he should get. For me, I would be offering them like obviously a year a year with a year's option if he if he plays a certain amount of games. But I mean, I don't know. Do you think do you think Looney would go for something like that? No. I think at his age, he wants, this is going to be one of his last big signing on deals and he's probably going to want a minimum of two years because at the end of the day, he's, he's, he, I don't know what he's going to do after playing football, but he's thinking to himself, this could be my last big one. So he's entitled to speak to clubs, which all players are when they're out of contract. And if he gets offered no money elsewhere, I would say good on him. But I would say to him, think twice about Turkey because what you get offered there and what you get paid there is two different things. But uh, I wouldn't be giving. I wouldn't be breaking the bank. Uh, I think he deserves a new deal for how he's been playing since the man just came through the door. But I agree with Davy when he was here at times. You know, I was on this post at times criticising him because I was blowing the face because he was awful. So I wouldn't be breaking the bank to keep him. The only person I would break the bank to keep is Jack Butlin. But I know when it comes down to money, people offer for Jack the club and they knock it back because I think the manager does see the see our squad of players and. He's probably pushed a lot of these players to the limits as in the way they're performing because before he came through the door, I didn't think we won anything this season. I thought I'd been in Spanish. I thought this team looked done. But he's done so well with the players that's here. But he also knows probably deep down he has to revive a lot of these, get rid of some of these players and bring new guys in. And you can see the way he wants to do it. And he's looking at younger players, more dynamic players. And I think it's in a back pairing. Maybe he's upgraded as well. So... It depends how much money he's got to spend in the summer. Giving John a big deal and break the bank, that might come off what he's got to spend. So I don't know. Listen, I wouldn't be bored if he stays. If he stays, great, because he's performing really well at the moment. But if he goes, good luck to him. Yeah, Davey, I'll come, I'll come back to you with this. Talk to me about Kemar Roof. Kemar Roof has had more chances probably than anybody in... Ryan Jack is obviously in the same mould as well. Too many injuries where you can't rely on him. But I'm going to contradict myself because he's got the obvious quality where he can do something a bit different, get you a goal. He's got a great knack, you know, of being in the right place at the right time. I personally felt that his best spell in a Rangers jersey when he was was when he played right forward off of Morelos 
in the 55 season. I think that's where he's most effective, when he can link the play with the 10, the fullback and Tav and whoever the central striker is. And he's got great movement, you know, he can spin very quickly and he's not got great pace, but he's got it up here and, and that's where Kemar Roof's at his best for me. I actually think he'll start tomorrow and I know this is going to sound ludicrous because you can't rely on him and it, it, more likely than not, you know, he'll probably come off of a, after 17, 18 minutes injured again. I hope that's not the case. But for me, he's just got something that nobody else in our team has, has got and that is his obvious quality and I think my team for tomorrow would be, I might as well just elaborate on it, would be Butland, Tav, Goldson, Suter, Sterling, and then I think you'll go Lundstrom, Diomande, and I think you'll go Roof, Cantwell, Lawrence, Silva through the middle. Now, personally, that that's a very attack-minded side, but we have to win this league, and you put your best attacking players, and if he's fit, let's face it, he's been training for long enough now, he's no had a setback, He's been used sparingly. He's had that one start. Let's see what he's got now. You know, this is probably the most runny form he's had in terms of not having an injury setback. He's had a good two weeks to recover there. So why not use him? He, he, he's got, you know, something that that we lack, and that is killer instinct. We, we don't have that in Dessers. As well as Silva's endeavour, as good as that is, he doesn't have the killer instinct. But for me, Roof has got that killer instinct. And if you've got a player like that, then you've got to use him. Yeah, Richie, coming come over to you. Um, Nicola Stubborn, if we keep Roof fit, the league, the league is ours. I don't think it's quite as straightforward as that. But I mean, as, as, uh, as, as Davey says, Kamal Roof, for all, for all his injuries, the guy's a born goal scorer. He's probably the best. He's certainly the best finisher we've got. And possibly one of the best finishers in the league. The problem is trying to keep him fit. Yeah, and I know it's it's almost become like a cliche now, but yeah, if a fit Kemar Roof is one of the best strikers in the league, never mind the best striker at our club, and and you know, you can take that back a step further and say uh, a consistently fit Kemar Roof probably wouldn't have signed for us. Uh, I could argue he'd probably be playing his trade in the. English Premier League now. That that's how um, how much I rate him. But of course, that's not the um, that's not the situation. But I, I do you know what I don't? D- Davy said um, you, you know that he was saying something that might seem ridiculous, but I don't think that at all in terms of him starting. Everybody's been speaking about well, if he stays fit, we'll just see him for the last 15, 20 minutes, and he'll be an impact player. But but why 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 does that have to be the case? Even if we think that you know he's not going to get ninety too consistently, why can't he make that impact for the first sixty minutes? We're in a two 0 lead. We're up two 0 three 0 three one. He comes off his minutes are managed. What? Why does it have to be when we're chasing the game or when we're looking for some kind of impact? I, you know. So personally, I, I could absolutely see that. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, may- maybe we can't quite say the league is ours if he stays fit, but certainly we're, we're really, we're, all of us find ourselves saying, where are the goals coming from? I mean, we, we know that we've got attacking players now that can contribute, but we don't have that player that you can sort of pin your first goal scorer um, bet on. You, you can't do it with Dessers, you can't do it with Silva. Yeah, they, they do have their qualities, absolutely. But I think, if, yeah, a fit, Kimar Roof, who can be used either from the start and managed towards the end, or as an impact, it is going to go a huge way to us. Um, yeah, to us getting fifty six. So um, I, I would, do you know, I would be surprised to see it um, because I, I, I think he'll probably end up going with um, Dessers or or Silver um, through the middle. But I would like to see it, um, and and particularly, you know, if we've got issues with who's going to play on the right hand side maybe sterling and McCausland can't play 90 then you know, shifting um shifting silver out to the left you could play matondo on the right and then you've got roof through the middle there there's these options as well so um yeah i think it's an interesting point and you know I'd, let's just hope that he can keep building on his fitness um but yeah it, all that being said it's like 
what you know, like the saying once bitten, twice shy. What's the one for like five times bitten, six times shy? You know, I don't even know what the uh, but that's where we're at with him now, isn't it? So I'm sure we'll be shaking his hand and uh, and saying cheerio to him in the summer, but it'd be nice if he um, if he had a few medals around his neck in doing so. Yeah, I mean, hope, hopefully the fact that we're, we're more or less just playing one, one game a week, which we're not going mid, midweek weekend, midweek weekend, apart from that rearranged in D game, which was a, an absolute farce initially. Um, you know, we're only really going weekend. There's a couple of midweek games in there, but at least it gives players like Kemar Roof, Ryan Jack, if we can get him back back on the grass as well, you know, time, time to at least, re, at least rest up between games. Supposing we'll have to wrap them in cotton wool and don't do a lot of training. Um, but uh, just before we finish talking about things that look like this, Charles come back in again with another super chat. So Charles, absolutely fantastic. Got to win the league for the for the right good transfer budget and everything that comes along with it. That's one hundred percent correct. Get rid of the injured injury prone players. It's not just injury prone players. Get rid of get rid of the players that aren't really um, doing anything, doing anything for the team. They're not really providing anything. I mean, guys guys like Scott Wright. I mean, Scott Wright. Scott Wright's done what he has to do, but he still needs to go. Oh, hold on. Lock, lock eye the news just popped up with a wee super chat as well. So thank you very much for that. We need a right a right back, a left back, a centre half, one or two midfield players and a clinical finisher. Do you think there's a chance Patterson will come back up the road? Scott Kerr, never even thought about that. Nathan Patterson getting a rough time at Everton. Um fell out with the manager, I believe, a couple of weeks ago. Although the manager laughed it off as one of these things that happens. So do you think we could coax Nathan Patterson back up the road? On a loan deal, nothing else. But I don't know. I think Nathan's proved himself enough down there. If he wasn't getting in favour of Everton, I think other teams would probably come for him in the summer to take him alone or other clubs will look at him. Listen, nowadays when football players are arguing with the manager, it turns out to be this big, massive thing, doesn't it? It doesn't matter who you play for, but everybody seems to make it like, oh, they fell out, they don't speak. How many times do you argue with somebody when you're at a workplace, when you're in a house, all the time and it could be over nothing. So listen, I think it's just one of the things that's happened. According to one of the Everton players split it up. But I mean, how many times did Rangers and through the year, especially through water time as arguments in the training ground and then they get on come a Saturday or a Wednesday, they were back all fighting for each other. So these things happen in football. I do agree with some of the points you made. We do need two centre backs, I feel. Also on my field I can we do probably we need I would probably just go through easy ways to see as we probably need to cover every position bar keeper. For me, I think Jack Butlin's the best keeper in the league, and I think if he stays in our season, which I think he will, then unless a offer comes in, it we just can't refuse. And I think we need cover for every other position, probably a start for every other position. Tabs, time could be coming at an end. Goals, and I know the manager stuck up for his defence a few times with some of the questions he got asked in press conferences because we haven't conceded a lot of goals. But when we're watching your, you know yourself when you're watching Rangers, sometimes just a hope for long ball causes has so much problems and you think why did somebody not go for it there why did not clear it away so many goals you can see we see issues obviously he doesn't want to say that but I do think we need a more dominant centre back pairing full back red band still there but I think we need somebody else in there as well I know Sterling can play but I think we need somebody else in there Tabs you don't know how long he's got left if Tabs stays Tabs probably plays in our season but we do need a right back depends what happens to Lundstrom I think Jack will be away and Roof's away, so probably Seema won't come back. My tone, though, I don't think it's good enough. Wright's not good enough. So you probably get Daniel to start his season. And the summer, I mean, is going to be your own centre forward option. So you need to bring guys in up there as well. So it could be big changes in the summer. So I'd basically back to the point is, I do think we need, we need to win this league. Because it all give us more money to spend. But you have to be careful as well how you spend the money. As we've seen, English clubs getting hit with the FFP. So it's not just because you've got money there you can spend it. You have to be clever with it as well. So... Nowadays, we kind of keep giving people contact just for the sake of it. And going back to Roof, let's never rely on Roof for anything at all. I think you've all covered it and you've all said it's pretty much spot on. But the reason he's here is because we were going through a phase we were saying injury point players thinking we can bring them to Rangers and when they come to Rangers, they won't be injured anymore. That doesn't happen. That's no real life. That's, I'm not going to come here and be fit. So it's just one of these things that's happened. And I just feel the manager's got a big job on his hands. And I still say this day, he's done wonders with this squad of players because this squad of players shouldn't be challenging for this title because I still think there's a lot of players here. No good enough. Can I just jump yeah, in there on what Kerr's saying there, Wolf? Yeah, it's just on, on the roof point, the only reason I raised it, and I accept 
in, in regards to his injury record. Absolutely. I'm the first one to criticise him for it. But his contract is up at the end of the season. He has to put himself in the shop window now. He has to make regular appearances and contribute by scoring goals in order to get himself a move. So as now was a time to utilise Kmar Roof. It is now. So I think that the sort of psychology behind that and Clement sort of gene him up and saying, well, look, if you want to get a move somewhere, you you need to perform for us. So you sort of lay down the gauntlet. And if he falls on his backside, then he falls on his backside. But you could use it as a motivational tool going forward to our benefit. Yeah, you certainly could. Uh, Dave, I was going to throw this one to you, but Richie, I'll throw, I'll throw this one in your direction uh, from, from Summers Smell the Glove. Our fan base have an obsession with re-signing the ex-players. This came off the back of the, the Patterson comment. Um, I've I've commented on that before. I don't know if I've done it on podcasts. I've certainly done it privately to friends of mine. Uh, it's something that we've been probably o- over-reliant on in, in the past, and it probably waste time that we move on from looking back. Because let's be honest, if you look back over the last 10 years, would you really want to re-sign a lot of what we had then? No, I think it's something that, um, it, it's not just our club, I think it's it's quite common. You, you've got um, players that you know, they end up leaving and they're some people's favourites and it can be quite divisive. And in that sense, people are still kind of like, it, it's almost the, oh, look what we might have achieved if, if such and such was um, was still here. I, I've heard it quite a lot with Ryan Kent this season, uh, particularly when we've had issues in, in an area where he was particularly strong. You know, you hear, well, I wonder what we might have been able to do with a, a firing Ryan Kent. The, the um, And then the nostalgia um, rarely works. It, it's the same way as... Um, you know, some of the backroom staff management setups going back, um, yeah, rarely works. The different contexts, different times, football's evolving, weight teams are playing are changing. Um, so but having said all that, you know, we're, we're here sort of here to speculate on, um, you know, particular players and, and comments that we receive. I, I don't think there's there's any sense of, our current regime looking back on anything or, or you know or that way i think the the deals that were done in january um off the basis of you know, seemingly having absolutely no money at all were, were fantastic and that gives me great encouragement for the summer if that's what can be done with some kind of loans with options to buy or obligations to buy then you know if if coppen and um, clement had a few quid then i'd like to think they'd spend it very wisely but as Kerr said when he was running through the team, you know, considering we had what we were all calling a significant rebuild in the summer, we are kind of in that place that we knew we were going to be, um, kind of back to square one, despite the team playing well and, and challenging for um, you know, for various honours that we didn't think were going to be possible um, that Sunday night when when Bale got his marching orders. The, the team is still kind of... Um, in a particular sort of state that that does need a an element of rebuilding and it and it's important to always look forward but i get the impression that um coppen has a particular profile of of player um <clears throat> that he'll advise and and i really like that and i think that will really play into our um our models for you know turning players over for a profit i know we, we don't like to see players here for one or two seasons but Ultimately, I think that's what we're we're going to need to do with sort of where we find ourselves in the wider footballing landscape. Unfortunately, but you know, success um, success gives you additional money, um, uh, you know, and, and and with that money, you can you can build for further success. So, um, yeah, we just going back to the initial point. Yeah, it, it's it's rarely good to be nostalgic, but I've got every confidence in in the current regime um, in making far better decisions than have been made in the last kind of 12 to 18 months. And Davey, moving seamlessly on to last summer and um, he who shall not be named, Beal trying to do some PR work with another job today, unbelievably deluded according to a comment from Scott Hammond. Now, I'm assuming that you've seen this this short interview that he did with, I think it was Sky Sports, where Mr Beal said, obviously, he was... Uh, shocked to, to be offered the Rangers job. He thought Gio was doing a good job and 
talking about the the, sum, the summer business, you said they possibly disrupted the group too much too soon. Is that the understatement of the season? Well, where do I start here with Michael Beale? He's the biggest shyster that I have ever seen in football, to be perfectly honest with you. A snake in the grass and the definition next to it in the Oxford Dictionary is Michael Beale's name because that's exactly what he is. Now, for me, Rangers, when you're associated with a club, there's a way in how you conduct yourself and that's on and off the pitch or on and off the coaching field or in the director's box. You know, there's always been a precedent in, in how you carry yourself as a Ranger. And for me, Michael Beale, when he, you know, he, he's, he's saying, oh, I thought Giovanni Van Bronckhorst was doing a great job. Well, see that, I, I can't go the two-facedness of that because he was in the director's box in the Aberdeen game when there was an absolute mountain of pressure on Giovanni Van Bronckhorst at the time. And see, for me, you don't do that. That is just no how Rangers people should conduct themselves. And see, for that, he should never have got the job. Now, at the time, I was new on the podcast, and I know there was a lot of people at the time in terms of the comments going in when his name was linked with it, or Beal Party 55 and 55. Who, who put this narrative out? you know, that he was the guy responsible for 55. If you watched Stephen Gerrard and the way he conducted himself in the presser, you know, Clement, I think, is a bit better at it. But Gerrard had the same sort of gravitas as a, a Walter Smith or, you know, Clement now. They grab your attention. They know how to talk to Rangers people with sound bites and what they say. They get it. Michael Beale was never that guy. You know, it's all been about what he done on the training field. And as we've seen, there's been burner accounts on Twitter and all the rest of it. You know, he's putting this out about himself. And for me, I don't know why he's getting the airtime. He doesn't deserve it. He's been a glorified failure everywhere he's been. When he went as part of Gerard's staff to Aston Villa, it came out this narrative that he was a great coach. And then when he left Villa, that's where Gerard failed. But they were actually in a lower position, you know, when he went there anyway and left when the time Gerard was sacked. So Michael Beale is just somebody for me that should be getting no airtime whatsoever. He's a poisonous snake in the grass. And the longer he's kept out the game, the better for all concerned. Right, David, don't, don't hold back. Tell us what you were thinking about Michael Beale. <laughs> Um, Charles back in again. We have another wee super chat. Davy well said uh, he's a twat as Bill. And while we're on the super chats, Rangers Forever 55. Thanks very much for the support. Love the pod. Thanks very much indeed. And if you can love the pod despite the fact that I'm hosting it, you're doing you're doing really well. So right, anyway, that's that's enough. That's enough about my, about uh, about Mr. Bill. I just thought I'd throw that at you, Davy, because I know how much you, you care about the guy. So, Scott, the thing that I did a little bit for. The, the Twitter account at um, uh, late morning because nobody can come on and do a breaking news pod because we says we'll talk about it tonight because I'm not on it but it turns out I am on it. Um, the there was an announcement this morning that going forward from season 24-25, with all fun games are concerned, that there's going to be around about and this is quite an interesting an interesting phraseology around five percent of Ibrox and around five percent of Parkhead will be given up to away supporters. Now. The way I personally would see that is it'll be around 5% of Ibrox will be 5% of Ibrox and around 5% of Parkhead will be about 4% of Parkhead to give us about the same allocation. Yeah, it probably will be. We'll probably make it the same amount of tickets. I asked them, listen, it's one of these things that's been going on for the last few while. Uh, obviously, they might be feel now they've got their way with it. They didn't get the full stand back, but they've got more than my saying. But listen... I mean, David was talking about sound bites, but I go Celtic are famous for that. Anyway, their sound bites they change it constantly. They keep saying it isn't safe to come out of which is nonsense. But it's far easier to get in and out of iBooks than it is getting in and out of Parkhead. So I just think it's probably better all around because it does produce an atmosphere that people like to watch, especially watch it on TV. Even when you're there, it's great. You know yourself, Alf, being at uh, Parkhead and Rangers winning, it's fantastic in there the end. And they're probably thinking the same being at iBooks. Obviously, they still gripes a bit, obviously, we, we took all your tickets away, so they've done it with us. But at the end of the day, it's kind of came back, not to where it was, but came back where they're going to have fans at Ida Stadium in a larger amounts, which is better. Probably safer for us as well going there, because 
you know, yourself off, you can have 10 minutes at 10 in the morning. And the game isn't until half 12. So you're in the stadium for two hours before a kickoff. You're so dull to do, do you know that way? And then you were, you were getting kept in after it, and I fed one, you were staying in as well. So you're getting pelted by everything thrown at you, but it's safe enough for us, but it wasn't safe enough for them. So it's probably better, whereas we've got more tickets at either stadiums, it's better atmosphere. But probably a, a lot of this is came through TV as well. You probably find it Sky. I know there are a few people caught in the chat said that, but I've seen that this morning. You probably see a few people with TV companies weren't they happy there was any fans at the game because that produces a better atmosphere for TV and the, the obviously this game's going the whole, the whole world over. And it wasn't sounding like that because the no away fans in, so it probably helped Paul and Case because at the end of the day, it's really the only game that any fan out of Scotland really wants to watch. Yeah, uh, Richie, as Stuart says in the, in the comments, just carrying on from what, Co- what Kerr said there, that uh, thank God Rangers and Celtic wisened up. No atmosphere without the away fans. It, c- it certainly makes a difference. I mean, the manager commented on it today in his presser when he w- when he was asked um, for his for his comments on it, and and you know he said obviously, you know, first time he's ever experienced a game where there's absolutely no away support in at all, other than the, the, other than COVID when there was nobody in. So I mean, it, cert- it certainly makes a difference. Uh, have, having supporters, even if they are just stuck out, stuck away in a corner or whatever. But do you, th- do you think that effectively the European allocation is the correct thing for them to do, or should they have should they kept it as it is? Should they go to the eight hundred? Should they get the whole? What's your opinion? Yeah, well, the, yeah. There's there seems to be sort of three distinct camps. Um, I, I've I've heard you know people. Suggesting it's sort of the, the most sensible way forward, and um, the slightly increased allocation that, that we see in Europe, and um, if it's you know fully taken up, um, but there's also loads of people I'm seeing that you know think that we should have carried on with um, w- with the um, the scenario that we've seen uh, this season. I, I don't think that it was viable to to continue that way, and and as Kerr said, I'm sure there will have been pressure from the TV companies in terms of the um, the product that they're they're paying their miserly amount of money for, um, but yes, it's it's probably it probably is the um, the, the most sensible conclusion. Um, and you know, guys like yourself, Will, you know, travel to the moon to watch Rangers. You know, it it's a crying shame when you're not able to do that. And, you know, certainly this season you've, you've not been able to do that on a few occasions. So, you know, I'm pleased for you and you know, thousands of others who travel um, absolutely everywhere. Um, but there is the other, the flip side, you know, those in BF four and five, um, I do feel for them as well. There's somebody was always going to be affected by this. And I think your, your stance is probably largely around how you've been affected but um, what I'm hearing, and you correct me if I'm if I'm not right on this, that you those in BF four and five will be given an opportunity to reallocate um, to another section of the ground, um, and if they don't wish to do so, then there's a, a refund on those games. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'm not sure that that's necessarily right, but then I don't have an alternative uh, arrangement that would have suited everyone. I mean, people's match day rituals, uh, you know, go on for decades. It's really important that like community around where you sit, the people that you, you know, what you do before a game and after it during, um, you can't just, you know, rip that away from people. But but there is no, the, there's no easy win that was going to suit absolutely everybody. So I think, on balance, it probably is the the right decision, and it's nice to see that you know they haven't got their way necessarily in terms of the the full number that they were supposedly holding out for on safety grounds. But we'll um yeah we'll need to see how it plays out. I'm I'm pleased um going into next Sunday that that we've got this arrangement because I, I do think it's a significant advantage. Um, as long as you don't absolutely shit it in the first ten or fifteen minutes. And then the crowd start getting really twitchy. I, I do think it's a significant advantage to to play just in front of your own fans, obviously. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how, how it is next season. But I, th- I think common sense has probably prevailed on balance. Just to say, well, I, I get I was speaking to some that sat in the broom room, but I'm actually not affected with that sit. Luckily for me, but the person I speak to this morning is affected, and they were saying that they're getting two options for your season. Like one include 
the Celtic game when not included. So if you don't include it, you're, you're going to have to pay a, a, a difference over £100 pound or something. It's £55 pound a ticket up charging. So, but if you include the Celtic game, what will do if, if you get one, you might not get the second one. So depending on how many people take the second option. So you're buying a season ticket without it and they'll pull you for the Celtic ticket when you get arcade in a different part of the stadium or you just don't pick it at all but you'll get the rest of the games but your season ticket's £110 cheaper. I was just going to say that to Richie. I believe that was that was the case that they're getting 100. I think it was 106 pound they were getting rebated, or they could get reallocated to a different part of the stadium, or as you say, they could potentially get one or possibly both both the games. Um, I know it's it's difficult for me to comment on it because it doesn't affect me because I sit in the club deck and it's never going to affect me. Same with when the Union Bears get asked to move, that didn't affect me either. So it's it's difficult. I'm I'm glad to see that there'll be. Some some visiting support in for both the games, but if, if it means that one range of supporters who currently gets to see see game all from games that I don't has to miss out, then they have to think of something else. But that's that's what the that's the the thing that the thing that bothers me is the SPFL statement when they said that um, for the rest of this season there'll be zero allocation. There's never been zero allocation. We've always offered them tickets; they just haven't offered us any. So it's just the, the way that you know basically they've got out of jail again. Because the game at Christmas time, they should have the, the SPFL should have should have forced Celtic to offer us an allocation of some sort. It's up to Rangers to accept it or not, and they should have done the same for the one coming up after the split. But that's that's splitting hairs. They've, they've they've come to an agreement now, so that also means that there's more tickets available for a week on Sunday. So a few more people will get to the game that didn't think they were getting to the game. So that's so that's always got to be good. And Davy, something else I know you're quite clued up on. And it's not directly, and it doesn't directly involve Rangers, but it's going to, is on Monday, which is obviously prior to a full Ibrox full of Rangers fans, none of them in it. They, there's a new bill getting introduced in Scotland, which could put an awful lot of people in an awful lot of bother. Um, the, the, hate, the hate crime bill, which is probably going to cause one or two issues when it comes to policing of these, these games in the future. Well, we don't want the Rangers rabble to go all question time on our listeners and and viewers and lose them. But unfortunately, it, it is something that has to be spoke about. Now, you know for a fact, and we'll take Hibs as the example since we're playing them tomorrow, when teams lose, they look for an excuse and you always find sound bites come out from the directors due to fan pressure. And the one that sort of hits the nail in the head nine times out of ten for them is to target Rangers and Rangers fans for sectarian singing. And and, and they do it all the time. Now, from Monday onwards, obviously, if, if people aren't aware, you know, the Hate Crime Bill Act will become live. So, for example, you, you know, it could be like the only an excuse sketch that Jonathan Watson used to do when he, he played the Celtic fan and he says, oh, Thetanta, do you want to turn that up? Do you hear sectarian singing? You know, that's where it's going to be. It's going to be, you know, open season on Rangers fans because we're a target. No one likes us and we don't care. Yes, absolutely. But we will be a target because of this. And, you know, if the result doesn't go one team's way, then what's going to happen is you know, there's going to be numerous complaints about Rangers fans and the police have an obligation to investigate that. So if you're a season ticket holder and there is a video or camera footage of you, you know, singing something that you shouldn't be singing, then the police can chase that up. You would lose your season ticket. And I think the punishment by this hate crime law is a maximum of seven years in the jail so obviously nobody wants that but what I think the club could do and I don't know if guys like Heart and Hand and Four Lads Have a Dream have, have been in touch with them but what the club could do is we know the number one song that's going to be targeted by that is the Billy Boys for example and we know the lyrics that will cause offence in that so the club are in touch with singers who have recorded songs like the famous RFC that gets played before the games so why don't we just change the words and put the words on the screen, negate it. So the song, hello, 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 you know, it's by a noise. Why not change the bit 
to we'll fight until the day is done, surrender on you'll die for we are. You know, you could change whatever you want because, and, and I know people, and I apologise for my singing, I apologise for that, but what, 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 what you could do is it will annoy more people and more of your haters if we find a way around it if we are able to sing the song and keep it going. Because see, when you hear hello, hello for the terrace, terraces, you, that is inspiring. You know, it is inspiring. And I'm not talking about the lyrics of the song and people who call me anti-Catholic or whatever. I'm inviting the club to change the wording and we could put that, because it's a great song. For me, it's a great Rangers song. Your dad taught you that as a boy and it was passed down generations, generations. So we move with the times. So let's move with the times change the lyrics, put the lyrics on the screen. And do you know what that will also allow us to do? It will allow us to sing it at UEFA competitions and fair can he do nothing against it because the lyrics are on screen. That's the lyrics there. Job done. Away we go. And we're having a great time. 56 singing hello, hello. So what you're actually asking us to do is to move with the times and go back to what it was when it was originally written because that's the way it was actually originally written because I've got a seven-inch... Um, vinyl single, kids ask your, ask your parents or grandparents what one of them is, um, in a box somewhere from 1960-odd that I got off my grandfather. That That's exactly how the lyrics were, and you're 100% spot on. That's what that's what the club really need to do. But, I mean, just to make people aware, they have to be very, very careful. And it's no... And I don't I don't doubt for a second, because Ibrox will be... Well, for the last time at an old firm game, just before the Rangers fans, they'll try and go to town on us. So we just need we just need to call very canny. Anyway, we're coming towards the end of the pod, and it'd be very remiss of me on this Easter Sunday, the 29th of March, to not mention the fact that the late Arnold Peralta, who was once of this parish, would have been 35 years old today, had Arnold not been taken from us, I think eight or nine years ago now, when he was he was sadly uh, gunned, gunned down, if I remember correctly. But uh, Arnold's no longer with us. And also on a on a somber note, and I'm not going to um not going to finish on a somber note, I'll find something to, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever frequented the Wee Rangers Club uh, on on the Emerson Drive, but Andy Andy McCutcheon, who used to be the head steward there, big, big Andy, I didn't know his name, I've, I've spoken a few times, uh, Big Andy was the doorman and then latterly the manager, sadly he passed away this week, um, Andy was a lovely guy, absolute gent, look, if you need if you were needed something at the, the Wee Rangers Club, you know, he would do it for you. Um, obviously, I do quite a lot of stuff with the Rangers Sports Yards can appeal. They did, did a lot of collection points at the Wee Rangers Club. Andy was always very, very good at helping him with that. So, uh, on behalf of myself and obviously everybody in the Rangers Rabble would pass their thoughts and prayers on to uh, Andy's, Andy's family at his, his sad passing. Because um, that's that's never nice. And obviously, the same to the late Arnold Peralta, who... Although he was he was he wasn't with us in the in, in our better time in our, be, in our better times, he still, you know, he won a, he won a, he won medals with us, so you you know you can't really take that away from him. So so yeah, we'll always 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 remember our own. So um before we go, Scott, we'll go back to the game the game tomorrow. Hibs at Ibrox, you said at the start you're working to one and then hot footing it across to the stadium. So yeah. what sort of victory are you going to be witnessing? How how many are we going to be winning by tomorrow? I think it'll be a hard game, Wolf. I think Hibs are a decent side attacking my defensively they're sus. But I think attacking wise they've, they've got good players up top and they've got guys who can punish you if you make if you're not clued up at the back and that's when I said earlier, we we'll have to play better than we did against Marlow because Hibs will punish us if we, we are slack at the back. But we've got a good record against Hibs. We, we beat them at Easter Road in the Cup there with coming back up European game. A few players missing, but I thought we performed really well that night and Listen, I know it's the old cliche like Richard likes to say, but just a game at a time. You just have to go into tomorrow. Not thinking about any other game apart from tomorrow. And no matter how badly we play or how good we play, we just need to get a three points at this time of the season. It doesn't matter about performance, it's just getting a three points and going on to the next one. So I'm hoping for but I think we I think Hibs will score, but I think we'll score more. So I think, I think it could be three one. Okay, Richie, how do you how do you think it's going to going to play out tomorrow? Yeah, I'm actually. I mean, even though they've, um, <clears throat> as Kerr said, they're they're decent at attacking and they they will pose problems, but I think they're quite a good opponent for us actually at Ibrox. Um, coming off the back of the the break, I think we'll we'll get lots of 
chances. There'll be lots of opportunities on the break. And I think that will give us a um, a good opportunity to score a few goals, even if we do concede, which I, yeah, I agree. I think we might. Um, so I think we will ultimately end up winning fairly comfortably and uh, and heaping the pressure over to Sunday. Um, yeah, 4-1 for me. Um, I don't think, yeah, we won't have it all our own way, but I think ultimately the the, the cup game was a bit of an anomaly with the sendings off and and the um, the, the way that played out. But the, the league game um, back in the January, there's just so much space um, down either side. I, I actually, I, I know there's um, Matondo isn't too popular with good reason, but he had so much space um, that evening. So I think we might well see him on the left hand side with Borna at, at left back, uh, unfortunately. But that that might well be fine for for tomorrow at least. And um, and yeah, he should be able to um, exploit them. Uh, with the way that they play, that there's a, a as much as people can lord Montgomery for, you know the, the, the sort of style of play. There is a naivety to it, and I think we'll be able to exploit it. So yeah, I'll say, I tell you what, okay, I'll I'll say four one um, roof to open the scoring as he's going to be in the starting eleven. How about that? <laughs> you got it, Davey. They won't have successful fight against Hibs this season if we beat them tomorrow. Do we get to keep them? I don't think I'd want to keep them. Well, they're, they're quite is, well. Is the correct answer? Uh, is the correct answer? And um, on the scoreline tomorrow, I think I'm going to go five-two with a hat trick of James Tavernier penalties. I really hope that doesn't happen because if it does, that will be clipped up. But we all over the place. It'll be all sorts of conspiracy theories. And on on that note. We are going to we are going to absolutely love you and leave you on that five two James Tavernier hat trick of penalties. So from the Rangers Ramble, obviously we'll be back tomorrow with um, post match and pre match, and I don't know who's doing what because as usual I won't be doing any of it, and I know Scott Kerr won't be doing any of it, um, and it might be a wee bit fractious with, with Martin being away because I know he's got a family thing to deal with, he sh- so he will be up. Something something will be happening before the game tomorrow, and something will be happening after the game tomorrow. Uh, that basically, folks, the easiest way to do it is to is to like like and subscribe to the podcast. That way, every time we go live, you'll get a wee notification. I believe that's how it works. I'm still a bit of a luddite, but I believe that's how it works. So, don't be shy if you don't already like and subscribe. And we shall catch you all on the other side. Cheers. Goodbye. <laughs>